Tonight's guest is, in my opinion, one of the greatest investigative journalists of our time, Whitney Webb. Her work is very detailed. She connects dots unlike anyone else and cites her work. Her latest piece is about J.P. Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon and how the same power players who gave rise to Jeffrey Epstein were the ones who gave rise to Dimon as well. But the piece isn't what you'd expect when connecting Dimon and Epstein. The connections and the power behind both men goes much, much deeper and is much, much broader than a sex trafficking ring in the Bahamas. It goes straight to consolidated control over our lives and the rollout of central bank digital currency. Whitney, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. It's my pleasure to be back. Thanks so much, Kim. Okay, um, I gotta admit, I read this piece, The Rise of Jamie Dimon. Um, you connect so many dots, it's actually difficult to keep up. I feel like I would have to read this piece, which is on, the, on your website, Unlimited Hangout. It says it's a 34 minute read. So this is a long piece. I'd have to read yeah. this 10 <laughs> times over, I feel like, to fully understand the web of connection that you've uncovered in this. And when people think of Jeffrey Epstein and Jamie Dimon, you know, they, they, they want to see a clear connection, but you have uncovered a very complicated web of connections that include people like Antony Blinken, uh, well, his stepfather, I suppose, that includes the Soviet Union. You know, when we think of Epstein, a lot of us think Mossad, Israel, CIA, mm -hmm. maybe these like more direct connections, but you have brought in the Soviet Union, um, a variety of different uh, like a privatized sort of CIAs that are existing in this country. The web is complex, and I feel like you're on the brink in this piece of uncovering why everything happens the way that it happens in this country, why everything <laughs> from wars to the Federal Reserve mm -hmm. to um, the secret, uh, the deep state to a level that is. Uh, so let's let's try to. So this is a lot to unpack, but let's try <laughs> in the yeah. hour we have. Um, first of all, let me ask you, you have this is a series you say, how many pieces can we expect from this series? Um, it's probably going to be at least four. So the first two parts are going to be out. Um, well, the first part's already out, right? And the second part will be out uh, before the end of the month. Um, and the rest of the series, what I hope to explore are the connections of Epstein, as well as Jamie Dimon and JP Morgan, uh, to the 2008 economic uh, crisis. Uh, more specifically, Jeffrey Epstein's role in the collapse of Bear Stearns, which is really underexplored. Um, and very problematic given what has since been uncovered about Epstein and his role in financial markets and on uh, his relationship with people like Larry Summers, for example, that relationship began when Larry Summers was deputy treasury secretary under Clinton and when he was treasury uh, secretary and involved in the repeal of Glass-Steagall. And a lot of people that I talk about in the first piece that's already out, including Robert Rubin, Sandy Weil, who's Jamie Dimon's mentor, were instrumental in the repeal of uh, Glass-Steagall, which a lot of people, uh, in my opinion, rightly point to being a major factor in the 2008 um, economic crisis. And that crisis, along with many crises, economic crises in the past, in the more recent U.S. banking crisis going on right now, uh, have the inevitable end result of increased banking consolidation. And this is really the logical conclusion of the too big to fail model, which really began to be built in the 1980s uh, by people like uh, the head of Bank One, uh, the McCoy, uh, the McCoy family, and then um, Jamie Dimon and his mentor, Sandy Weil, who create what is now Citigroup. And eventually the goal of too big to fail is to continue merging and merging and merging banks until you have a very small um, amount of commercial banks left and then the people on top of those banks of course would essentially dominate the entire u.s banking and financial services industry and i think this is essentially where a lot of this is leading because as uh, your viewers are probably aware we're entering this new paradigm where there's this push for central bank digital currency which is really redefining essentially what money is and there is a plan in the works at least in the united states to have commercial banks have a very specific role in that cbdc paradigm 
uh, one uh, way that's been uh, posited as potentially functioning is having the Federal Reserve issue uh, the digital dollar or the CBDC tokens, and then uh, banks like J.P. Morgan Chase or some of these bigger banks on Wall Street that are left after this latest round of consolidation will be the issuer of the digital wallets that hold those tokens, for example. So there's a plan to keep this two-tier uh, banking system, uh, you know, to, to keep it, have it continue into this new paradigm. And the idea is to have only a few banks left at the end of the day. And Jamie Dimon, as, he as head of JP Morgan, has presided over that uh, for, you know, decades now and has played a key role in that. And that's why I think his rise is so important because it's important to understand uh, who put Jamie Dimon where he was and, you know, in a sense, who he's essentially beholden to, uh, because he may seem like he's, you know, the king of Wall Street, but he's there because certain powerful factions chose him to be there. He became head of J.P. Morgan Chase, as I note in the piece, because he was first selected to be CEO of Bank One in the year 2000. And a few years after that, Bank One is folded into J.P. Morgan Chase and Diamond is put in charge of the newly combined entity. So in order to you know, understand how Jamie Diamond got to that point, you have to understand uh, what Bank One was in 2000, who were the people that selected him. And as I note in the piece, essentially the same people responsible for Jeffrey Epstein or the same people responsible for Jamie Dimon. And this is particularly timely in light of the uh, court case regarding JP Morgan uh, and its knowledge about Jeffrey Epstein's sex trafficking and other um, illicit activities while he was banking with JP Morgan which uh, more or less began after the collapse of Bear Stearns in 2008 and continued, I think, until roughly 2013 or so, which is notably when one of the main characters in this series, James S. Crown, uh, comes under fire because he was actually in charge of J.P. Morgan's or one of the main figures in creating risk, the risk policy and risk management policy for J.P. Morgan at the like top executive level as a director of the bank. And of course, uh, it was this risk management policy uh, that was controversial uh, for a couple reasons at, at that particular point in time. But as we know, no, know now, it also allowed executives at the bank to essentially green light what they knew was illicit activity uh, in um, um, at the bank that involved, you know, Jeffrey Epstein's accounts and they uh, knew it was going on and did nothing about it. And that's, you know, what this court case um, being prosecuted by the U.S. Virgin Islands is essentially about. See what I mean? I mean, this most people, when we think of Jeffrey Epstein, <laughs> we think, like I mentioned, a link to Mossad or maybe he was working on behalf of the state of Israel, blackmailing powerful people in order to get dirt to maybe, uh, you know, that's what that's what a lot of us think when we think Jeffrey Epstein. But you're saying, oh, no, the 2008 crash, by the way, <laughs> Jeffrey Epstein, uh, that well, there's. Mm -hmm. th there's th these connections are beyond just maybe the um, the desires of the state of Israel or Mossad or the CIA or any of this. This actually goes to financial institutions marching us towards a CBDC, marching us towards um, why many of these small banks are being forcibly collapsed into the larger banks in order to have that consolidated control to roll out CBDCs to make uh, the collapsing of crypto. All of this seems to be. I mean, how did all this tie into Epstein? This is this is what's crazy about this. But these connections are real and they're there. So, um, OK, so let's let's first I want to I want to break down a little bit of before we go into the case and his connection with Bank One and Jeffrey Epstein, Jamie Dimon, um, his connection with Citigroup because and I want you to kind of lay that out a little bit, because from what we know from a failed um, a, a failed um, uh, inquiry into the Federal Reserve. There was somebody that that uh, submitted for a, uh, it's just blanking on me right now what it's called, the um, information request, right? So they, they wanted an information request from the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve came back and said, oh, you cute little thing. We're not subject to this, <laughs> to these requests, because <laughs> essentially we're a private company. But they said, but we will let you know some information. And what they did tell us, the Federal Bank, the New York division, which many inside the financial world says that the New York Fed is actually the real Fed. That's who really, truly controls the Federal Reserve is really the New York branch. When, what they mm -hmm. did reveal in this in this like revelation was that the Federal Reserve of New York is actually owned. The shareholder is primarily J.P. Morgan Chase and Citigroup. And Citigroup. But they together mm -hmm. pretty much own the Fed. 
And that they're pretty much the Federal yeah. Reserve, and they're the ones really ushering in every single decision that's made by the Federal Reserve, yeah. right? <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, that, that that's honestly fair to say. Yeah, the, the New York Fed is seen as the most powerful part of the Federal Reserve System and essentially guiding where, you know, the decisions made by uh, the Federal Reserve itself and its chairman, which is currently uh, Jerome Powell and the top shareholders or owners, I guess. Of the New York Fed, as you pointed out, our Citigroup and J.P. Morgan Chase. J.P. Morgan Chase is currently led by Jamie Dimon. Jamie Dimon essentially created what is now Citigroup. So you know that one man has a lot of influence. A as lot it of relates influence. to what is viewed as you know central bank policy, but really, like you pointed out, in the U.S., the central bank isn't public in the way that a lot of people are led to believe it is. So that's how powerful Jamie Dimon is. He is somebody that centrally could be the figure in charge of wanting to create these CBDCs, rolling out the central bank digital currency, wanting to consolidate all the small banks into a very small group of, of powerful banks that are too big to fail. That's how powerful Jamie Dimon is. It isn't just that, oh, he's the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase. This person is a very large figure. So connect with us then. Um, so let's go, let, should we start with bank one, uh, is what I'm thinking, because this is the, the bank that ended up ultimately giving rise to Jamie Dimon, putting him in charge of, as you mentioned, JP Morgan Chase, but bank one has got some seriously suspect ties and history. So yeah, let's most break definitely. that down. Um, so Bank One historically is sort of uh, was sort of based in Ohio in the late 90s. It relocated to Chicago, Illinois uh, when it merged with a bank called First Chicago NBD, which was itself a result of a merger that happened in 1995. Um, but Bank One for 65 years, uh, with that 65 year reign ending in 1999, uh, was led by the McCoy family, a grandfather, a father and a son. Um, in the piece uh, that is currently out, I talk mainly about the father and the son, uh, John uh, H. McCoy and his son, John B. McCoy, who's the one that resigned in 1999, uh, paving the way for Jamie Dimon to be installed as CEO of Bank One. Uh, John H. McCoy, I found very interesting straight away because he is named by both uh, Leslie Wexner, who most people are probably familiar with because of the Epstein case. He was Epstein's main benefactor and his only uh, provable client for much of his uh, work history, including during the period of time when he was known to be involved in sex trafficking activity. So um, Wexner names uh, McCoy as one of his top mentors from the time he was very young, as does Wexner's right-hand man, um, John W. Kessler, who is uh, nominally referred to as a um, Ohio area real estate developer, but has a lot of intimate connections that are quite disturbing when you look into them um, with Leslie Wexner, his business interests, and also has a lot of connections himself uh, to Epstein and has worked with Epstein, particularly on what uh, Kessler is best known for, which is this uh, real estate development in New Albany, Ohio, which was Wexner's idea and was uh, originally formed as a joint partnership between uh, Kessler and Wexner. And um, while McCoy, this particular McCoy, the father McCoy, uh, was in charge of Bank One, uh, he involved the bank, allegedly, in uh, the laundering of money for arms sales as part of the Iran-Contra affair. Uh, and Bank One was considered one of the top four favorite banks uh, for Israeli intelligence to launder uh, money for arms sales. And this is coming from former Israeli intelligence operate, uh, operatives that were involved in laundering the money of those arms sales uh, directly. Um, and three of those four favorite banks are now part of J.P. Morgan Chase. One of them merged with Bank One before it became part of J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, Valley National Bank, which uh, was previously involved with scandals, for example, involving the McCain family, the Keating Five scandal um, and all of that. And Valley National Bank uh, had a lot of other a suspect connections uh, about it and was uh, merged with Bank One, I believe, in 1992 or 1993 and, um, you know, uh, continued, I guess, those activities uh, after the merger. Um, at some point in the mid 1980s, John B. McCoy uh, took over the bank and, you know, continued to have a close association with both uh, Kessler and Wexner, uh, who were on the board of the bank for a considerable number of years. Uh, but by 1995, Wexner was still on the board of Bank One. It's not exactly clear when he left because there's not a lot of um, 
a lot of Bank One's uh, previous records prior to the merger with J.P. Morgan Chase are not easily found today. Um, and Kessler claims to have been added to the head of the bank by John H. McCoy when he was a very young man. Uh, but records uh, that I found from Harvard that are in an academic paper put out by Harvard Business School place it at 1982 when he was not a young man. He was like in his 50s. So it's possible he was on the board of the bank and then left and then came back in in the 80s. But um by the time that Jamie Heim, uh, Diamond was to be hired and there was a search for a new CEO after John B. McCoy leaves, Kessler is one of the people uh, involved in choosing him, along with uh, this other faction that comes from you know the Chicago side of Bank One at the time in 2000, the Crown family that we can talk about later. Um, but in as far as Kessler goes, um, as I note in the article, um, there's a lot of controversy around his relationship to Wexner, at least when you look in the uh, into sort of the dark parts of what we know or what's public or what can be publicly found about Wexner's past because he's quite a secretive man. Um, for example, in 1985, um, the tax attorney uh, for Wexner's company, The Limited, was shot in the face in broad daylight the day before he was going to testify to the IRS about suspect activities. Um, and this murder to this day is uh, classified as unsolved, but in the early 90s, a few years after, when the investigation was still considered active, uh, there was a police report developed by an analyst um, that was heavily censored uh, by the police chief, which by the way, uh, the Columbus police chief had a very cozy relationship with Leslie Wexner, vacationed at his home, vacation home in Colorado, among other things. So that's important uh, background information as to why he might wanna censor this document because this document and talking about the murder of this lawyer whose name was Arthur Shapiro, is pretty much entirely about Leslie Wexner and his ties to organized crime, the ties of the second richest man of Ohio at the time, who was a business partner of Wexner's, Edward de Bartolo, uh, his ties to organized crime and how in, the invest in, in investigating what Shapiro might have revealed when he testified to the IRS, uh, it was this inter, uh, interlocking web of all these different business entities involving um, John W. Kessler, Leslie Wexner, um, a former city councilman for the city of Columbus named Jeremy Hammond, um, and, and some other entities. But Kessler's businesses were front and center with a lot of these. And the uh, Kessler and some of these suspect Wexner companies shared office space with each other. And by the time this report was written, the vice president of a few of those companies had become Jeffrey Epstein, was previously held. That post was previously held by Wexner's previous um, money manager before Epstein had that role, whose name was Harold Levin. So um, there's definitely a lot of connections there. And then you have the fact that after Shapiro was murdered, uh, Epstein was essentially brought in to quote unquote, clean up the new Albany project, which Kessler was nominally in charge of, and which was uh, a joint vex uh, venture between him and Wexner. Uh, so, I mean, Again, like you said earlier, this is an insane and complicated web, but I, the reason the piece is long is because there's a lot of details to understand, but it's an undeniable fact that John W. Kessler is one of the closest associates of Leslie Wexner and was intimately involved in some capacity with Jeffrey Epstein as it relates to New Albany and some of these uh, suspect business entities that are identified in this uh, you know, heavily censored police document.